In this video, we're going to speak about the different legal issues associated with the profession of ethical hacking and penetration testing. So when we talk about this, the first thing you have to note is you have to talk to your attorney in your area before performing ethical hacking. Uh, you want to make sure you talk to them before you do any consulting work to make sure that you understand what your legal bounds are. The reason I say that is that laws change from state to state and from country to country. So if you're doing this in Canada versus the United States, there's different laws. If you're doing this in uh, India, there's different laws there too. And even sometimes in our states between New York and Florida or California, there's different laws. So those laws and regulations regarding cybercrime can vary from country to country, state to state. So always check your local laws first. This will help keep you out of jail. Due diligence. We talked about this a little bit before, and I, I brought up the Eastern Transportation Company case of the tugboat, the, the TJ Hooper. They lost the uh, the tug the tugboat had lost its cargo, the barge, in a storm because they didn't have a radio. Uh, again, due diligence is making sure you're taking those reasonable steps by taken by a reasonable person in order to satisfy a legal requirement. So we talked about the tugboats and cybersecurity in the previous lesson. Other things for due diligence. If you're going to take data during a penetration test, you're not going to post it to an open website. You need to make sure it has been it has been uh, encrypted and then it is given back to the customer in some offline method. So maybe I, I stole a customer database to show them that their database was vulnerable and that was within the bounds of my contract. As soon as I got on my computer, I would take safety precautions to make sure somebody doesn't steal it from me. And that due diligence would be something like encrypting it, burning it off to a DVD and locking that DVD in a safe until I give it with my final report back to the uh, customer. Because if I got hacked by a hacker and they took those, that customer data that I had hacked from the company I was working for, um, they're going to be pretty pissed with me, right? Uh, so due diligence means you're going to take care of those things and you're going to do what a normal and reasonable person would do in that situation. Crime and criminal procedures. So hacking. Hacking is covered by the United States Code, Title 18, Chapter 47, Sections 1029 and 1030. Now, this is called the Crimes and Criminal Procedure Manual. Uh, what do you need to know if you're going to be taking the ethical hacking exam? A lot of you watch these videos, that's what you're studying for. Uh, you need to understand what section 1029 and 1030 are, uh, and you need to understand what they apply to, because they may have a question that says which of these laws applies in this situation, and you'll have to answer section 1029 or section 1030. So with section 1029, it's the fraud and related activity with access devices. So this prosecutes people who knowingly and with intent to defraud, they produce, use, or traffic in one or more counterfeit access devices. They, they use these access devices can be an application or hardware that's created specifically to generate any type of access credentials. So if I'm using Mimikatz as a way to harvest credentials on a network, I am committing a crime under 1029 because I have taken somebody else's credentials and I'm using them, so I have, I have produced, used, or trafficked in one or more counterfeit devices, right? Um, if I stole somebody's RFID card um, or cloned it, that is doing this 1029 act, okay? Um, now, again, if you have to get out of jail free letter from the company, they're not gonna prosecute you because it was within the scope of your contract. But if you're doing this on your own without a contract in place, you can get in trouble for this. Section 1030. Fraud and related activities with computers. This pretty much covers anything in the general hacking area, right? So it covers just about any computer device connected to a network. It mandates there's penalties for anyone who accesses a computer in an unauthorized manner, or here's another interesting one, exceeds one's access rights. So if I have an insider, right, the pros I can use this to prosecute them. So if I have, say, an administrative assistant, or somebody in the supply room or the mail room that uses their account and their authorized credentials in an unauthorized manner or tries to take their user account and make it into an admin account to conduct fraudulent activities, they can be tried under this section of hacking as well. So it's, it's a very, uh, very all-encompassing law and you can really get yourself in a lot of trouble with this. So again, keep within the bounds and keep within the scope of what you're allowed. This is why those get out of jail free letters and that scope of work contract is extremely important to keep you out of trouble. So other laws that we have out there, there's the Federal Sentencing Guidelines of 1991. This is basically a document that gives the judges a guidance so that they can give uh, sentences in a more uniform manner. So you may have heard in the news there's a, a person who has done hacking and they get a month of jail 
or you see somebody else in the news who does hacking and they get 12 years in jail, right? It's all up to the judge of what they can do. But this gives them a set of guidelines that says, well, if it's this bad of an offense, maybe you should give them a year. And if it's this bad of an offense, you'll give them five years. And this bad will do 20 years or whatever it happens to be. Um, doesn't come up very often on the test, but just something I wanted to mention. Economic Espionage Act of 1996, kind of old, 20 years old at this point, it defines strict penalties for those accused of espionage. So economic espionage. Um, you see a lot of things in the news about other countries hacking into U.S. companies, uh, taking data. That would be under the Economic Espionage Act. Um, for instance, let's say I, I broke into Coca-Cola server because I wanted to get the secret formula for Coca-Cola because I just love me some Coca-Cola, right? Um, that would be probably under this Espionage Act. I was stealing it for the, the act of theft and espionage. Uh, U.S. Child Pornography Prevention Act of 1996 uh, does what it says. It's all about combating and reducing the use of computers to produce or distribute pornography, uh, specifically to children. We want to make sure we keep it out of the hands of children. Uh, things in this law, it says that if you're going to have a porn website, for instance, you have to have warning banners that say 18 and over only. In the old days, you actually had to verify people's age. Now there's a lot of sites out there where you can just get to them. Um, th those are the kind of things that are covered under that act. Uh, and, and in fact, you have to verify that the models are 18 or over. Uh, Electronic Communication Privacy Act. It mandates provisions for access, use, disclosure, interception, and privacy protections of electronic communications. So if you're doing something like wiretapping, I'm listening to somebody's phone in a PBX system, that would fall under this. Uh, packet capture on wireless networks definitely falls in under this. Man in the middle of text messages or SMS, those again, or even of emails, that could all be interception and privacy, uh, destroying the privacy and the integrity of those communications. That is something that would be covered in this Electronic Communications Privacy Act. One of the big ones out there, the USA Patriot Act of 2001. So in 9-11, uh, September 11, 2001, we had the uh, terrorist attacks in the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Uh, and part of that afterwards was we created the Patriot Act, and that gave the government extreme latitude in pursuing criminals. Uh, this allowed them to monitor hackers without a warrant or perform sneak and peek searches. Um, that law had been modified and changed since the original signature in 2001, uh, where they had to go through um, federal courts um, or intelligence courts uh, to be able to look at that data. Uh, it was created by the War on Terrorism, Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2002. This mandates life sentences if a crime could result in another's bodily harm or possible death. So let's say you have a, a teenager or a young adult who decides they want to hack the 911 system because they think it'll be a good time. Uh, that person, somebody has a heart attack and they call 911 and the ambulance can't get there because 911 isn't working because somebody had done a DDoS attack on the system. Um, that person that did the hacking could be convicted uh, under this law because they have caused bodily harm or death of somebody because of their hacking. So these are things you have to, you have to think about. Um, again, when you're doing your, your, your testing and your penetration to an organization, it shouldn't lead to something like this, but you gotta be careful. Uh, if you're doing something like a uh, SCADA attack on a power grid for a power company, and that takes out power to uh, hospitals uh, or traffic lights and causes accidents, you may find yourself in this situation. Uh, again, just something to be aware of and something to be uh, worried about. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA. Uh, this is protects you certain types of information that the government maintains as sensitive. This includes things like password theft, extortion, and malware. So if I write a malware, uh, for instance, the author of the Morris Worm, he was prosecuted under this law because his worm infected government computers, giving him unauthorized administrative access and caused damage to the systems in the, in the realm of millions of dollars. And they got him under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Again, these laws, there's lots and lots to them. There are pages and pages and pages long. I'm just giving you the, the two-sentence answer so that if you see them on a test, you'll be able to identify them. The Federal Information Security Management Act, the FISMA. It was signed into law back in 2002, and it addresses information security requirements for non-national security government agencies. So what does that mean? Well, a non-national security government agency might be somebody like the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Or it might be somebody like um, USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. Um, this provides them with a framework for securing their government-owned and operated information technology, infrastructures, and assets. So it basically is a risk-based assessment and a cost-effective security method 
for them, it gives them what they are required to do as a baseline to provide cybersecurity for those non-national security government agencies. So if we're talking about the uh, classified networks of the military um, or any of the other uh, intelligence agencies, they don't fall under FISMA. They fall under a uh, what's called NSD 42, National Security Directive 42, which gives um, them permission to do security on their networks and monitoring. For FISMA, we're talking about non-national security systems, government-owned. HIPAA, the U.S. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This was concerned with privacy and security regulations for the healthcare industry. The primary goal of this law is to make it easier for people to keep their health insurance and the key thing for us in the cyber world, protect the confidentiality and security of healthcare information. And it also helps the healthcare industry uh, have administrative costs, uh, keep those under control. But really it was all about the confidentiality and security. So lots of information out there on HIPAA and a lot of security tests are done to show HIPAA compliance. So as an ethical hacker, you will probably be uh, familiar with HIPAA uh, because it will get you some work. Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, instead of doing healthcare, Sarbanes-Oxley was really focused on accounting fraud and anybody who is a US public corporation, board, management, or public accounting firm. So basically if you're a publicly traded company, for instance, uh, you have to have financial disclosure requirements. And that means you have to have proper um, backups, proper continuity of operations, you need to do security checks. So again, this would be an area where you're looking for Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. There is security testing that goes along with that. This outlaws the willful destruction of evidence to impede a federal investigation. You wouldn't think you'd need a special law for that, but after the, uh, the issues we had with Enron and WorldCom, Congress passed a special law under Sarbanes-Oxley that says you can't destroy the documents. So. They were doing some of that with actually shredding paper, but you could similarly do it by deleting files from a server. So you have to make sure that if you are one of these publicly held firms, you have to have backups upon backups to make sure that any time your records could be shown uh, when called upon. GLBA, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, it protects consumers' data at financial houses. So if you're talking about insurance companies, banking, uh, or investment firms, they fall under this law and have similar compliant security tests that must be performed. Similar to HIPAA for healthcare, but this is talking about financial houses. DSS, the Digital Signature Standard. This generates digital signature standards for e-documents. So if you've gotten a mortgage recently, uh, most likely you didn't sign 300 pieces of paper when you applied for that mortgage. You probably went to a website and clicked a couple of times and did a digital signature. That fell under DSS and the requirements for DSS and what is legally bounding, uh, binding. Now, DSS is not an actual law. It's not congressionally mandated. It is an agreement across the industry of what constitutes a digital signature. So it's more of a policy than a law. Another one that's a policy and not a law is PCI DSS, and that's the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. So this is a proprietary information security standard for organizations that handle major credit cards. So if you accept credit cards in your business and you process them, you have to have proper controls in place. Uh, you'll fall under PCI DSS. It increases controls to reduce credit card fraud. And again, this is not a law. It's an industry control and policy. So not legally binding, but if you break these rules, then Visa or MasterCard can say you no longer have the ability to process credit cards and take that away from you, which in the business world will cost you money. And that's this section on legal issues, uh, that, as we talked about. So uh, for the ethical hacking exam, the things you need to know is you should be able to identify those legal titles, what those laws or policies are, and what things they, they affect. So if I said, <clears throat> you are doing a security test on a bank, which of these legal issues might you consider? Uh, well, since it's a bank, we would be looking at GLBA. Uh, if we said you were doing it on a investment house or a publicly traded company, a better example, then you have to worry about Sarbanes-Oxley. If it's a doctor's office, you'd have to think about HIPAA. So those kind of associations are what you want to be looking for. Again, if you enjoyed the video, subscribe to our channel and uh, share it on Facebook, Google+, or Twitter. Uh, you can reach us at youtube.com slash Training.